Hey everybody, I'm Mike McDonald. My buddy Jesse Stratton loves some of the cheesiest movies ever made. He spent years telling me about them all, so now I'm finally watching these movies for the very first time. This is our podcast where we break those movies down together. This is the Celluloid Dumpster Fire. Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we are discussing the 1981 Canadian horror film about a boy and his teddy bear and their adventures in peeping and murder. We are talking about The Pit. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Before we Hollywood get started, though, uh, for some reason, we are getting a lot more listeners on YouTube and glad you guys are here. Thank Hit you. the like button on the videos. Let us know what you want to see in the comments. Love to hear from you guys. I don't know why you're listening, but I'm glad you're here. I know why they're listening. Yeah. 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 They're on YouTube. They're weirdos. I'm on YouTube. That's where I hang out at. So <laughs> I can smell my own kind. We're out there. It's interesting in that it's a Canadian production filmed entirely in the U.S. Yeah. And the original screenplay was far darker and perhaps a lot less pervy than the final film turned out to be. Yeah. There was also a novelization of the film called Teddy by John Galt that said to fall a lot closer to the original screenplay than this finished film did. Word of warning, there are several other films by the same name, including a 2010 documentary about commodity tra commodities traders trying to make money from coffee and a 2019 action film about a bare knuckles pit fighter trying to retire and having to fight for his life to do it, and a 2021 film about two hikers trapped in a sinkhole. <laughs> I'm sure that all of them make a lot more sense than this movie does. I don't know, that one where they get trapped in a sinkhole is kind of like this movie. It could be like a sequel. Could be, way. yeah. Maybe but, so, you know, yeah. If you want to see this movie, and I don't know why you would, uh, look for the one that looks like a creepy coloring book of a kid and a teddy bear. Yes. That's that's the one you're looking for. Movie was made on a budget of $900,000 Canadian. There are no box office numbers, so there probably wasn't a U.S. theatrical release. Or maybe it was direct to video. I don't know. I don't know. I know it was released under a bunch of weird names, but okay, I think, yeah, there's like, you know, you you like see other movies in like other countries and shit. Yeah, but it's like that. But like, uh, it's usually the pit or yeah, like Teddy. Someone will go like, I think the French one's called Teddy and shit. But um, yeah, it's it's like uh, it, the only reason this movie is famous is because the drama that went on behind the scenes, right? And it got re-released on Blu-ray by one of those weird, you know, distributors. And yeah. so a bunch, a bunch of movie nerds started talking about it again, and here we are. Yeah, the Blu-ray seems like something you would see in the the three for ten dollars bin at Dollar General. The movie's rated R for nudity and violence. Runs an hour and thirty seven minutes and has a forty two percent freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know how it got that high. And other the Blu-ray, just a a few a few ratings. Tim Brayton of Antagony and Ecstasy said the 97-minute running time seems every bit of 20 minutes longer than the filmmakers were ready for. <laughs> That's pretty good. And Mike Massey, he had a different take on it, saying, Though the gore is minimal and scares almost non-existent, the story has enough potential to inspire a bigger budgeted remake. So essentially, the critics agreed that somebody else could have done a much better job of making this movie. Oh, yeah, no. Like, I'm surprised, like, when, you know, that Blu-ray got released and shit, and a lot of people, because, like, a lot of people seen it for the first time because of that. Right. The, the A24 didn't, like, pick it up and, like, remake it or something, like, one of those, yeah. like, the Hulu horror shit. Like, I mean, it's, it's right. I mean, it's a really good storyline, except the director... Came in, and this is one of the things where I like. I'm like, hey, the studio should have came in and pulled a plug on this. Like, yeah, absolutely. Wait. Like this guy's going crazy on this set, and he does. I mean, he knows what he's doing, but I don't think you know the vision. I don't is, think he knows what he's doing. 
you know, the writer and the producers were invested in like a really good story and they had this gym and they were going to go to town with it. And then the guy took the wheel and crashed the plane or something. He just fucked it up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You drove your Bentley right into the, uh, the bridge support. (laughs) And then it exploded. And then, you know, it got released on Blu-ray, you know, a couple of decades later. And then everybody talked about it. Right. The director we're talking about is Lou Lehman. This is the only film he ever directed. Um, (laughs) Watch the movie and you'll understand why. He also took it upon himself to largely rewrite the script, which really pissed off the writer. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, The the guy who wrote that original screenplay was Ian A. Stewart. He wrote a version of this movie where the kid was eight instead of 12 and the monsters were entirely in his head, which would have made this a lot, lot scarier movie. Yeah. He also wrote a documentary on the Highland Regiments of Canada and nothing else. So a lot of really short careers around this movie, with the exception of this guy, special effects costumer Dal Delu. He was art director for The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Silver Spoons and the entire run of Cheers. Hmm. So somebody came out of this alive. Yeah. Someone had to make Ted Danson's head look smaller on TV. (laughs) Well, they covered up his bald spot, too. Oh, man. Yeah, I forget what I saw that on, but uh, it showed him getting getting him ready for camera. And he was going bald in the back. You know, Ted Danson had huge hair even back then. It was huger he then. Huge but he head. was going bald in the back. So they had a little bitty toupee that they put over his bald spot. And then they spray painted it to blend it into his natural hair. Sam Malone. Man, oh, man. Man, that guy's going to kick my ass if I ever run into him. <laughs> I said so much shit about that guy. I'm sorry, yeah. Ted. <laughs> he got to date Whoopi Goldberg. You got to give him that. Yeah. Movie stars Sammy Snyder's as Jamie Benjamin. He had a brief career as a child actor in Canada, including appearing as Tom Sawyer in the Canadian TV series Huckleberry Finn and His Friends. And he currently works as a dance teacher. When he was in uh, dance school, like he loved that shit, right? And yeah. he was in the same class with Michael Myers from Saturday Night Live fame. Really? Okay. Yeah, that's true. Did did he teach him how to do the Dita dance? <laughs> you going to teach my monkey? <laughs> I'm also, as happy uh, as a little girl. He was in like some chocolate milk commercial in Canada that ran all the damn time for like a decade. So he was like the Canadian messy Marvin? Yeah, or the uh, Mikey will eat anything. Oh, shit. Yeah, okay. like, like, like that, like just the commercial was on in like the late 70s and the 80s. Yeah. Ginny Elias is Sandy O'Reilly. She's the other person who made it out of this movie alive. She appeared in a few films and episodes of The Twilight Zone and Magnum P.I. before transitioning to voice acting in 1983. That's what it was. Man, did she make did she make it there? She yeah. has voiced characters in Strawberry Shortcake, My Little Pony, The Real Ghostbusters, and Teen Wolf. She was the voice of Princess Toadstool in the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. She was Pugsley Adams in the Adams Family cartoons and Huey Duck in Quack Pack. Yeah. And when video games became the big deal for voice actors, she headed in that direction and landed roles in X Men Legends, EverQuest 2, Ghost Recon 2, Age of Empires 3, Mass Effect. Final Fantasy 13 and the Elder Scrolls Online. So, you know, start doing your vocal exercises. That's it. In early. Yeah. Once everybody's a robot in the movies, they're going to want someone to talk and you're going to be top of the list. Also, if you would love to be an actor and you're not sure you can do it, voice acting. Voice acting, yeah. This is all the, also the feature film debut of Sonia Smith as Mrs. Lind. She's mostly known for Canadian TV and film. She appeared in episodes of Falcon Crest, The Fall Guy, and Airwolf, along with the Ray Bradbury Theater and David Cronenberg's Videodrome. God, I love that movie. That's probably one of the most messed up movies I ever loved. Yeah, all of David Cronenberg. I mean, I used to get shit for it when I was young because I was into it and shit, but like, I don't know. 
Now everybody's right. like in the movies and shit and talking about them and stuff. And they're like, uh, oh, Cronenberg, you... Cronenberg. I saw yeah. about it. I heard about it on Rick and Morty. I remember seeing Brood when I was really young, right? And that movie fucked yeah. me up. <laughs> so very weirdly, this movie opens with a clip from later in the movie. What the fuck? I hate it when they do that shit. Kids are throwing food at each other and slap fighting at a Halloween party. Uh, a boy in a ghost costume, which is really just a bed sheet with eye holes, is walking <laughs> through the crowd. I got a rock. <laughs> <laughs> he appears to be looking for somebody. He approaches a boy in a pirate costume who is with a girl in a ballerina costume. This is Freddie Phelps and his girlfriend, Christina. The ghost boy is Jamie Benjamin, who asked if he could be in Freddy's club and got punched in the face for it. Yeah, they do that weird flashback thing. They do a flashback in the preview. Yeah. Well, now that he's in disguise, he's talking like a cartoon gangster, see? Yeah, see? And he wants to talk to Freddy in private, see? To give him something, see? Yeah, uh, meanwhile... <laughs> Meanwhile, the Halloween food fight continues. Well, Jamie leads Freddy and Christina into the woods where he has a bag of jewels and stuff. Must be worth millions. But I can't take it home, so you should take it for your club. Provided you let me be in the club and you don't punch me in the face no more. <laughs> Christina's scared, but Freddy assures her that it'll be okay and they walk deeper into the woods. As Freddy examines the bag of jewels, Jamie walks around behind him and pushes him into the pit. And we get the title card and a shot of a teddy bear with glowing orange eyes. This looks like it was probably the, the trailer to the movie. And they just tacked it on to the beginning of the movie. Like some kind of teaser-like type thing. Somebody kind of forgot to cut the film there, I think. I, don't know, I like that title card, though, that font. Like the title like card is pretty cool. Yeah, that font really draws in. Like, ooh, that's going to be spooky. You know, we get a shot of a school bus driving down the road as the opening credits roll. Inside the school, Jamie is writing on the chalkboard, Bart Simpson style. He is writing, I will not bring adult books to class over <laughs> and over and over again. <laughs> oh, man. The adult book he brought to class was called Creative Nude Photography. And his Ooh, teacher la, la. misses, I know, his teacher, Mrs. Lynn, she flips through this book, you know, just to see what it's about. She knows what uh, it's about. <laughs> yes, she does. Fair warning, this movie is pervy as fuck. It, it, to a really uncomfortable degree in uh, some places. Yes. Like the middle, the middle of the movie, I'm like, I'm fast forwarding and shit. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Sammy Snyder's was 15 when he did this, playing a 12-year-old who acts like an 8-year-old. Yeah. It was originally written as 8. Right. And then, like, when the guy rewrote the script, when the director rewrote the script, he wanted to add comedy to it. And yeah. his idea of comedy was to make the guy older and then add a bunch of sex stuff. So yeah. it would be like porkies. And then, man, it changed the entire tone of everything else in the script. Yeah, it's not like Porky's. It's not. It's disturbing. It's more like <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. It is really bad. Uh, or like, what was this? The Red Dragon? Yeah. All the worst parts of Red Dragon. All the uncomfortable parts of Red Dragon is in this movie. Yeah. Well, Mrs. Lynn flips through the book and finds the body of one model has been very carefully cut out. And when asked, Jamie says, it was already like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Now, Mrs. Lynn says that Miss Livingston, the librarian, will find some way to repair it. After sending Jamie home, Mrs. Lynn returns the book to the library. In an office, the librarian, Mrs. Livingston, compares the cutout page in the book to a note that she received that is a, a photo of her face pasted over the photo of the nude woman from the book, and Jamie is outside the window watching all of this. So he did like a weird pre, uh, like edited photo, like a Photoshop thing, and then sent it to the librarian. Yes. Yeah, this kid's a creep. He needs to get arrested, like right yeah. now. <laughs> okay. Here's here's your face on a naked body. This is what I imagine you look like. 
and then I want to secretly watch you look at it. That's fucked up. This guy yeah. is a serial killer, and he's like only like yeah, thirteen. Yeah, no. this is this is the kind of guy you see on the evening news who was picked up at a quickie mart somewhere, or or to catch a predator. Doing a chocolate milk commercial. Yeah. <laughs> Well, she tears up the note, and a janitor catches Jamie watching from the through the, from the window and, and runs him off. At night, Jamie's mother is discussing Jamie with a potential babysitter named Sandy O'Reilly. We get a flashback to Jamie's first encounter with Freddie Phelps, where Jamie gets punched in the face for asking to join Freddie's club. As Mrs. Benjamin warns ja- uh, Sandy that Jamie might develop a crush on her. It's going to go so much farther than a crush. He has no friends, boys or girls, and that's when we flash back to an encounter with Abigail, which is a strange name, but we'll go with it. Yeah. It's the librarian, Miss Livingston's niece. Jamie is looking at her bike when she yells at him angrily and rides away after calling him a funny person. The insults in this movie are written by someone who has never insulted anyone ever. It seems, yeah, the acting in it kind of seems like those, uh, like those 1950s, like, like Reefer Madness and shit. Like, yeah, kind of like a PSA. I, mean, I don't know, uh, like, um, after school specials, like, uh, you know, the vast majority of these actors, this is their only credit. They never did anything else. So, you know, yeah, but yeah, apparently Jamie's a funny person. Sandy is sure that that this is going to be fine, though. She specializes in babysitting exceptional children. Back on the street, a couple of old ladies appear. One is pushing a blind woman in a wheelchair. The one in the wheelchair is Mrs. Oliphant. And uh, the one who's pushing her tells him to get out of the way. He does. And when she finds out it's, it's Jamie, Mrs. Oliphant says that she's really glad that Jamie's parents have decided to move elsewhere because he is he is not right and he'll probably grow up to be a hippie. Uh. <laughs> it was 1971. Actually, it was 1981, wasn't it? 1981, yeah. It feels like 1971. Yeah, that's another thing. From it's the costuming and, yeah. and everything. It feels like 1971. Canadian production, filmed in America. And like a weird town called like Beaver Falls, and everything looks like uh, Archie, kind of like the library. The yeah, library looks like a fucking castle, man. Yeah, with a like, with what? a uh, with a pep rally sign over the door. <laughs> yeah, man, it's like. But it was filmed on location in in Washington or Wisconsin. I mean, yeah, Beaver Beaver Falls, Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, one of the producers had a daughter that went to school there. And she loved it, and he would visit her, and he's like, "Oh man, that place looks perfect, you know, like it's just you know all out there." So they moved it to America, which is weird because the whole Canadian horror boom was because you get tax breaks in Canada, right, right, and that's why they just they just was shoveling them out during the day, yeah. you know. It's a lot more expensive to make something in Canada now for an oh, American yeah. company, anyway, because for every American that you bring into Canada to work on a movie, you have to hire a Canadian also. Yeah. So they, they're moving all that shit to Georgia. Yeah. Well, Mrs. Benjamin is explaining to Sandy about Jamie's imaginary friends when Jamie's father arrives, and he explains that Jamie lives entirely inside his own head. As he's explaining this, we get to see Jamie feeding his pet frogs, which live in his room in a terrarium. Also, Jamie's dad explains that an old lady in the neighborhood caught him swinging in a tree wearing nothing but a Superman cape. <laughs> Who hasn't done that before? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no. My neighbors hate me. Well, they wouldn't have hated you if you had done it when you're seven. It's a different thing when you're 37. <laughs> I couldn't afford a cape when I was seven, man. <laughs> That was a nice cape. You know, back in the 90s, my parents lived next door to this family, and they had a very young grandson who, when he went outside, all of his clothes came off. And it wasn't a big deal, you know, when he was like four. But when he was seven, when he went outside, all of his clothes still came off. It started to get a little. It should have bought him a cape. 
apparently Jamie was caught swinging in a tree wearing nothing but a Superman cape and said he was playing Tarzan. At dinner, Jamie's parents are talking with Sandy. Apparently, Sandy's staying for dinner. They're talking with Sandy. As Jamie is watching through the distortion of a drinking glass, Jamie's a little, a little out there. His parents are planning to go to Seattle to look for a new house. So that's where they're moving to. And Jamie yeah. is fixated on how everyone is chewing. I like this part. Like, it's where it gets kind of like artsy and shit. And you see how like this kid's like not all there. And he's having like, he's like fixated on weird shit like that. Like yeah. that was kind of creepy. Like some of the cinematographer here, especially when they start showing the creatures and stuff, it's like really creepy. Yeah, but it's almost like almost like a a, a description of autism before they knew it was autism. Yeah, until Jamie decides to drop his napkin so that he can get down under the table and get a peek up Sandy's skirt. So we went from pervy to interesting back to pervy. Yeah, this this director really fucked this movie up. <laughs> What's interesting though is his wife wouldn't allow him to be present for any of the nude scenes. Oh yeah, no. Uh, with the exception of one. With the exception of one, and we'll get to that much later. It was the one he didn't want to be there for, I'm sure. <laughs> hey, yeah, no, he said that. He actually did. Yeah. They had to get someone else, I think. Next day, Jamie's parents leave for Seattle. Jamie and Sandy are talking in the kitchen. Jamie finds out that Sandy has a boyfriend, and he's not real happy about that. He explains that he had to write something on the board a hundred times. Not a hundred, a hundred. Yeah. Uh, but then he lies about what it was. He's, like I said, he's supposed to be 12. He talks like he's eight because the script was written as an eight-year-old and the director didn't change any of that dialogue when he made the kid older. Now, when Sandy drops a knife on the floor, Jamie moves to get it but becomes very angry when Sandy gets it for herself. And she has to explain that women are allowed to do things for themselves now. She wants Jamie to go outside and do whatever. Uh, Jamie's going to go talk to Teddy. Teddy is sort of one of his friends. Upstairs in his room, we learn that Teddy is a teddy bear who talks to Jamie in Jamie's head using Jamie's voice. So Jamie is Teddy, I think. Yeah. And Jamie has a crush on Sandy. It hasn't even been 24 hours. He's in love. Teddy tells Jamie that Sandy is just what they've been waiting for. Meanwhile, Abigail is doing weird aerobics in the living room with her aunt. She asks her Aunt Margaret, about Jamie, and she wants to know if he's crazy, but but Marge says he's just distressing. That evening, Jamie, it's bedtime, and Jamie wants a bedtime story. Uh, but Sandy shuts that shit down real quick. Uh... <laughs> Teddy tells him to wait for Sandy to get undressed and then call her back, and that's exactly what he does. He waits for her to go into the bathroom, asks her to bring him a glass of water so that he can see her in her uh, sheer robe, backlit from the hallway, and get a glimpse of her figure. Now the phone rings and Sandy leaves to answer it. Jamie creeps down the stairs to spy on her. It's her boyfriend, Alan. Apparently, Alan is a college football player, and Sandy wants to go watch him play, but they have to take Jamie, too, back inside his room. Jamie tells Teddy that he thinks he should tell Sandy about his secret. I don't think it's a secret that, that Jamie's a perv. Oh, no. Like, whole neighbor. No. <laughs> Next morning, Jamie is dressed and in Sandy's room, staring at her exposed breast as she sleeps. And then the alarm goes off. Sandy wakes up and screams when she sees Jamie there sta staring at her. She tells him he needs to knock before entering. Jamie says, don't worry, I'd never do anything to hurt you. And he's going to tell her a secret after breakfast, which Jamie actually cooks the breakfast. I'd have got the hell out the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing creepy shit and then creepier shit. And now he's staring at me while I sleep. I'm probably going to die. We call them parents this is, real quick. This is, turning, this is starting to look like a Stephen King book. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> It appears there have been a lot of women who have come to babysit Jamie. 
and they all were smarter than Sandy. They all left and never came back. That's uh, funny because they actually started this movie with another chick in this role, and for some reason she just she got out. Yeah, they had to it's go with a this creep. Movie. It's a creepy thing to be in. I would have left too. Well, Jamie's big secret is that he knows where there is a great big hole in the ground with things living at the bottom. And they're not people. They are hunched over, and they have small yellow eyes. And he tries to say trollic, but he calls them trollologs through the whole movie. Yeah. In the screenplay, they were called troglodytes, which was him mispronouncing troglodytes. Right. And, of course, that would make sense because yeah, he's like a young kid in the screenplay. Yeah. But in this one, it's just he's just gobbledygook crazy talk because he's a crazy person. Yes. Well, Jamie leaves the head house and heads out into the woods where the hole is. He gets to the hole in, hole in the ground, the pit, and calls to the trollologs. And sure enough, they are small creatures with glowing yellow eyes down in the bottom of the pit. We get a POV shot from inside the pit, which reveals they have very poor eyesight. Jamie tells the trollologs that Sandy knows about them now. <laughs> she's done for. I'm just going to say it now. She's Go ahead and write her obituary. She's done. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to Sandy and Jamie at the football game. And this was so damn funny. Every time Alan uh, got the ball, Sandy was cheering. And Jamie was cussing. (laughs) (laughs) Throwing his popcorn on the ground. Yeah. Biting his his lip really hard. (laughs) Making the biggest scowly face he could. Well, the game ends and afterward, the game ends kind of weird because (laughs) it doesn't end with a whistle. They snap the ball. Alan gets the ball. You hear a gunshot. And he falls to the ground. Man, Canadian football is weird, man. I, I don't. Canadian to football is hardcore. At the end of the game, we shoot the guy with the football. <laughs> and then they get to drink maple syrup. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, if you drink the maple syrup right away, it just closes up the bullet hole. Yeah, we just use yellow flags and shit. I don't know, man. They're just yeah, they're wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're driving. Alan is driving them home, and he gives Jamie a football. <laughs> <laughs> which Jamie throws in the floor in the back seat on the way home. Alan says, Hey, you want me to teach you to play football sometime? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Jamie's not a fan. <laughs> not hell no. They get back to the house and Jamie gets out of the car halfway up to the porch he decides to run really fast and hide behind a porch pole. They'll never see him there. And that way he can spy on them. And sure enough, Sandy and Alan are kissing in the car and Jamie is pissed about it. Stewing. Stewing, man. Stewing, yes. That night, Jamie's in his room crying and Sandy checks on him in her short robe again. And we hear the Teddy voice telling her to go away. Next day, Sandy's at the library tar- talking to Marge Livingston. As she checks out books on problem children, Marge has something she wants to tell Sandy about Jamie. Cut to Abigail and her bike. Jamie walks up and Abigail has changed, has had a change of heart about Jamie. She was wrong to call him a funny person and he can ride her bike if he wants to. (laughs) Like a moron, he trusts this girl. He gets on the bike, which immediately falls apart, causing Abigail to fall to the ground laughing. Oh, man. It's, it's like he, he like giddy ups on it like a horse. And like the yeah. front just comes out and it just folds and he just falls on his ass. Like he gets on it and immediately tries to pop a wheelie. And, yeah. and, and that allows the front tire to fall off. And, and down he goes. And she thinks that's hysterical. Marge Livingston comes out of the house to find out what the hell's going on. It turns out this was all a gag that Abigail had pulled on him. It was the funniest thing she's ever seen. She sends Jamie home and tells him he shouldn't be talking to people. Just go away. Back at the house, Sandy is cleaning Jamie's room and finds a porno magazine under the mattress. Again, that would have been really weird for an eight-year-old. Yeah. (laughs) She looks through it, and then she puts it back. She says hi to the bear, and then she leaves. 
And then we get ominous music as the camera pans back across the room to the bear. And the bear's got googly eyes instead of the glowing orange eyes that we saw earlier. But its head turns toward the door. <laughs> Jamie's watching the snake in his terrarium. Then he's downstairs playing with his model train as Jamie, as Sandy asks him about having no friends. And Jamie's not worried about that. He's got Teddy and he's got his pets. And he's got the trollologs. Sandy grabs a dictionary and looks up the word troglodyte. And she's trying to convince Jamie that the trollologs aren't real. But he is just not having it. I mean, he's actually seen them and talked to them. So, you know. So the subject changes to Teddy. You know, Teddy is Jamie's teddy bear. And Sandy tells him it is time for him to take a bath for bed. And if you thought we were creepy before... It's about to get even creepier. As, yeah. Jamie tells Sandy, or Jamie asks Sandy if she wants to wash his back. And very reluctantly, she agrees. In the bathtub, Sandy is washing Jamie's back. And, and Jamie tells Sandy that he thinks he has fallen in love with her. Well, she thinks that's beautiful, but she is just not interested. So Jamie changed the subject to the trollologs. And what do they eat? And she says they probably eat chocolate bars. You know, <laughs> imaginary food for imaginary creatures, right? Yeah. Also, Jamie's mom washes him a lot. He says, he asked, he asked Andy, do you think she, do you think she's really trying to get me clean? I don't think I'm that dirty. So Perhaps Jamie's sex obsession is the result of incest. And finally, finally, Sandy has been pushed to the point that she just gets up and leaves. Finally? Finally. It took Man. all of this to get her to get up and walk out of the room. Not very good judgment. If she dies in this movie, she probably had it coming. Some people should not be babysitters, man. Exactly. Next day, Sandy is going for a jog with Jamie's teacher, Mrs. Lind, while Jamie heads out to the pit. Sandy jokingly said that maybe the trollologs ate chocolate bars, so Jamie brought them chocolate bars, which he tosses into the pit. And not just any chocolate bars. He got those great big Hershey bars and Mr. Good bars. And that was a waste of perfectly good chocolate right there. Oh, well, hell yeah. I can't even find those bunch of good bars, man. Those are huge. I know. Sandy and Mrs. Lind are jogging in a park with a fountain that looks like it has a bloody swan on it. That yeah, was bizarre. Man. That whole town's fucking weird. <laughs> well, they stopped to get a drink, and it turns out that they have been discussing Jamie all along while they were jogging. He has no friends. The other kids are assholes to him. He has the highest IQ in the class, but he's not a good student. He likes science and drawing, but he can't spell for crap. Meanwhile, Jamie is at the library looking for a book. And Miss Livingston is watching. When Jamie leaves, she asks the assistant who is shelving books, what kind of books was Jamie picking out? And he, she said they were mostly about painting or drawing and some about hand, animal husbandry. So maybe he wants to be a vet. Yeah, or maybe he doesn't Andrew want to be Parkins. a bit. Yeah, no. <laughs> he does this not guy want to be a bit. Norman Bates written all over him, lady. Come on. <laughs> oh, my God. Outside the library, Jamie is looking through the table of contents until he comes to a section on carnivores. And in parentheses, it says flesh eaters. Cut to a butcher chopping meat. Jamie has come to buy meat for his mother. He wants a mixture of stew meat and hamburger, which he then tosses into the pit. And unlike the trollolog unlike the candy bars, the trollologs definitely like meat. Back home, Sandy's in the shower. We get a little bit of story, a little bit of purr. A little bit of story, a little bit of purr. Sandy's in the shower and Jamie sneaks in and writes, I love you on the mirror in red marker. He spies on Sandy for a minute in the shower and then heads back to his bedroom to wait with Teddy. Unfortunately, it was not the reaction he expected. I guess he thought that she was going to fall in love with him. Instead, she screams, and she's pissed. Super pissed. Super pissed. She comes storming into her, his room, and she, she, gives, he, she yells at him pretty serious, severely, 
and she gets up to leave. I think Jamie thinks that she is leaving the house completely now because he asks her a, for a photo before she leaves, but she's not leaving. Later, Sandy is outside watering the flowers, and Jamie sneaks into Sandy's room and steals money from her purse. Then he heads to the butcher shop for more meat. The butcher starts asking questions, and that makes Jamie real nervous, so he grabs the meat and runs out, barging into Marge and Abigail. And Abigail's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> because... Jamie runs into him. Jamie apologizes for running into him. Jamie heads off down the street, and Abigail says, Well, if it isn't clumsy stupid. <laughs> Damn, she's got jokes. She does. <laughs> she also suggests that Jamie sits under his porch and eats the meat raw. Close. Back at the pit, Jamie brought Teddy with him to feed the trollologs, and this is the last of the meat. That's okay. Teddy says he'll think of something. Teddy says it's a good thing the trollologs can't get out of the pit, and then he reminds Jamie of a plan regarding Mrs. Livingston because it's choir practice night. So that night at the Livingston house, Abigail has gone to choir practice, leaving Marge home alone when the phone rings. Jamie has called from a phone booth that is right across the street. And this was <laughs> long before caller ID or star 69. Neither one of those things existed yet. So Jamie has made a recording of his side of the conversation and he leaves it playing on a little tape player while he runs across the street to peep into Marge's window with his Polaroid instant camera. The recording says that Abigail has been kidnapped and no one will ever find her unless Marge strips for him. What the and fuck she, is wrong with I this I know. Kid? I think his mom washed his back too many times. Yeah, I think that happened to the director. That guy's got I a lot think of so. Support. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, it's a fucked up a fucked up situation all the way around. Well, Marge immediately starts unzipping her bodysuit. Um, she knows that it's Jamie, even though it's the Teddy voice on the computer on the tape recording. It's it's Jamie. Yeah, uh, she, they they add like a little weird echo to it or something, and he talks yeah. deeper. So I mean, it's definitely his voice, but they they give a Teddy voice, you know? Right. It's like in um, The Shining, you know, when uh, yeah. he talks to the guy, the, his future self is like, ah, I'm SSR. It's like that, you know, but yeah. Can... But the phrasing is so weird. That's a good Mrs. Living's. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's sedated and just psycho. Yeah, it's just creepy. Yeah. That's like, hi, Jeff's mom. Hi, Jeff's dad. That's a good Mrs. Livingston. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> she he's snapping photos as she's stripping in front of the picture window in the front of the house she finally gets all frustrated and says fine you want to see my body here you go and she pulls her pulls her bodysuit down revealing her breasts and that's when abigail walks in the front door and says aunt margaret what are you doing <laughs> says, well i was i was getting undressed and then <laughs> But uh, Jamie is long gone. Teddy and Jamie are back in his room looking at the photos. Teddy says he's going to spend a lot of time looking at those. Oh, uh, the creepy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, Sandy and Jamie are at the park. And she wants to talk to him about something. And she keeps hinting at it to find out if he's going to admit anything. And he's not. So finally, she just confronts him about stealing money from her purse. And Jamie runs off into a gazebo, so Sandy follows. Jamie pretends to, that he doesn't know anything about any missing money. So she just asks him up, straight up, did you take money from my purse? And Jamie doesn't answer. He runs away, and Sandy chases after him. Stupidest scene ever. Yeah, it, this is like the everything, all the drama is hyped up. Yeah. So it's like, to, I don't know, to using like an Oscar clip or some shit. It's like one of those scenes. It's like very dramatic. 
Yeah. Uh, totally like a, something you'd see in a soap opera. And it, yeah, the, the tones are all over the fucking place. You go super pervy to fucking almost cartoony comedy to fucking soap opera. It's just a disjointed mess that feels lazy, feeling confused and uncomfortable. Right. It looks like Jamie got away from Sandy, but she sees him duck behind a big flower planter. And when she gets there, he stands up with a handful of flowers and says, I picked you some flowers. See, uh, like <laughs> comedy. They're like, what the fuck? You ain't Bugs Bunny, little dude. Don't try this shit. I'm calling your parents and I'm leaving this house. Fuck this shit. Oh, my God. Back home, Jamie is eavesdropping on Sandy's phone call with Alan. She wants Alan to talk to Jamie, and he agrees, and Jamie is not happy about that at all. Next day, Jamie gets caught trying to steal meat from a butcher's delivery truck. It's like he's trying to pull out an entire leg of lamb or something. (laughs) And so when that doesn't work, he finds a cow. He tries to lead the cow to the pit, but the pit cow doesn't want to go. Oh, my God. So he tries to convince the cow to jump into the pit of its own free will. This is like, he is. oh, man, he's like, he's up against the cow's head, you know, he's like, look, your buddy. All right. He's giving the cow a pet talk to kill itself. (laughs) My buddies are in that hole and they're hungry and they would love to meet you. And and, and besides, somebody's going to kill you and cut you up into steaks anyway. Yeah, someone, you know, it's going to happen one way or the other, but, you know, help me out. Be a buddy. <laughs> Come on, guy. Yeah, the cow's not hearing it. <laughs> it's so fucking, he's the, he walks off defeated. The cow's like, I don't know what that guy's problem was. I'm going to go back to being a cow now. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So Jamie decides to chase down some chickens. Oh, my God. And he gets his ass kicked by chickens. <laughs> this, is, this is why I like this movie, is this whole fucking... <laughs> Just a break from the creepiness, you know? Oh, yeah, no. If they took out all the pervy parts, and this comedy part is what he wanted. Yeah, I know, you know, how, what he was thinking is like, well, you can't have a horror movie, and it's not going to sell unless you got, you know, like sex in it. But it's like, it's a horror movie, a psychological horror movie about a kid. Yeah. You don't want to put sex in it. It's like, it's, you know, you're going to mess this up. But at I'm this like, point, I, and I'll, even the music sounds like it's a Disney movie at this point. Oh, man. Oh, okay. So, like, they fired him from the movie, right? Okay. They tried to edit what they had, and they couldn't. So they rehired him back so he'll edit it. And that guy paid out of pocket to buy a (laughs) bunch of extra musicians to fill up to make it sound like, you know, an actual movie. (laughs) He still couldn't save it. That's why it sounds great. You know, like, it looks great for the time and shit. And it sounds great, but, like, yeah, it's a shit movie. Yeah. Back in his room, Jamie tells Teddy that he tried everything he could think of, and Teddy tells him there's only one thing left. And Jamie says, okay, but only nasty people. Dun, dun, dun. Cut to Jamie meeting Abigail on the street again. He wants to borrow her bike because he thinks of her as as his friend, and that's the kind of thing friends do. Well, she says no. And then he tells her, that he knows about a bike path that nobody's ever ridden, especially not a girl. And he leads her through the woods to the pit. In the woods, Jamie hides behind a tree, and he uses a trip line to knock Abigail off her bike. Then he jumps on her bike and rides off uh, to the pit with her following. And she just runs across the clearing blindly, not seeing this gigantic hole in the ground that is not disguised in any way at all. They didn't even put any leaves over it or grass or none of that shit that Snagglepuss would have done. None of that. And she just runs right into the hole. And yeah. the trolley logs eat her while Jamie watches, and then he rides off on her bike. Literally, the, it looks like someone dug a, a, a fucking swimming pool in a field and just left it there. I read that it took them two weeks. To make that pit. Damn. That sounds like somebody didn't know how to dig a hole in the ground. (laughs) Cut to Jamie talking to Mrs. Oliphant, the blind old woman in the wheelchair. Oh, apparently, apparently the blind woman in the wheelchair is the one who saw him 
swinging naked in the trees. Yeah. And he is thanking her for telling on him and getting his bike taken away as punishment, since he knows it was for his own good. And then he, <laughs> he unlocks the wheels on her wheelchair, and away we go in a comic ride up a big hill, through the woods, into the pit. This is like almost a Monty Python skit. You it's like, kind of you... like it's kind of like if this whole thing was done to Yakety Sax. Yeah, like you know, a Benny, Benny Hill, Hill music. Yeah, because all you see is like it, it, he pushes her, cut to big like a grassy hill, and he, they slowly pushing this old lady, and she's like bitching and waving her arms the entire time, and he's like, "No, nah, right. it's cool. It's all right, Mrs. Whatever. You're cool." And then, like, all the way and just marches her to this hole and just, like, dumps her. And then says, like, a fucking kill line, like he's Arnold Schwarzenegger in Commando or some shit. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. So, he just rolls her through rolls her through the woods, and she's going, ah! gets her to the pit, dumps her in, and then he's, he's riding out of the woods on her wheelchair, just giggling the whole time. Yeah. Like, after he dumps her ass out, he just, like, comes back, like, ha-ha, do-do-do. And, uh, oh, man, it's just so tone. It, from the rest of the movie, this and, like, where he's catching animals is, like, it's, like, a and, completely different movie. And it's all backed by this 1960s madcap comedy music. Yeah, it's like it's a mad, mad world or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh god next we see jamie playing football with alan near the woods they are tossing the football back as they work their way closer and closer to the woods and they get to the woods and uh, jamie takes the ball and he runs into the woods alan tells him not to go in there don't go after there and he chases after him muttering you little bastard (laughs) <laughs> he says we can't play football here it's too it's too closed in he says, no there's a clearing up ahead and they go to the clearing where the pit is jamie tells alan to go long and alan starts running looking back over his shoulder jamie says here it comes alan falls into the pit and the trolley logs eat him jamie says and there it goes <laughs> and then Jamie leaves the woods alone, tossing a football up in the air. <laughs> Movie's insane. At home, Jamie tells Teddy there's nobody else he can think of, but Teddy reminds him that there are two more people. And we're back at the Halloween party from the beginning of the movie. We've already yeah, seen this she. part of the movie. We're back at the beginning of the movie, she. <laughs> These are the last two people Teddy had in mind, and just like at the beginning, Jamie pushes Freddy into the pit. Christina runs away as the trollologs eat Freddy, uh, but Jamie follows her. He sneaks up behind her, and he yells her name and scares her. He yells at her for thinking it was funny when Freddy punched Jamie in the face, and Christina runs off again. He scares her again, and she wanders into the, the dark woods. Finally... She comes into the clearing where the pit is again. Jamie sneaks up behind her and whispers her name. And that causes her to faint. You know, how hearing your name quietly in the dark will make you pass out, I guess. Jamie takes off his costume and he apologizes to Christina because she's real pretty, but not on the inside. So he's going to feed her to the trollologs so that she and Freddy can be together in heaven. And then he pulls off the ruffled tutu from her ballerina costume. Because I guess he's got to have a souvenir from everybody he kills. And he tosses Christina into the pit to be eaten. Back at the house, Sandy has a new date. And she is walking him to his car. Up in his bedroom, Jamie grabs his spyglass to peep on him as they say their goodnights. Next morning at breakfast, Sandy asks if Alan ever came over to play football with Jamie. And Jamie plays dumb. Turns out that Alan has gone missing. She asks if Alan called here, or Jamie asks, did Alan call you? And when Sandy says no, he says, is that supposed to be my fault? And Sandy slaps the shit out of him. (laughs) About time. 
<laughs> yeah. Someone needs to do that. But she immediately apologizes. But Jamie turns all dark and tells Sandy, you know, Abigail is missing, and so is Mrs. Oliphant, along with Freddie and Christina. He also tells her that trollologs do not eat chocolate. She says she's really sorry for slapping him, but he doesn't she doesn't believe him about his secret. And she says she does. So Jamie offers to take her to see the trollolog. And she agrees, provided he gives up on this idea that he's in love with her. So Jamie leads Sandy through the woods for some reason. Going through a hike through going in a hike through the woods, because he told her this place was like a mile away through the woods. She's wearing a skirt and high heels. <laughs> she suggests going back to change into jeans and or something, but they're almost there. And at the pit, Jamie calls to the trollologs. Sandy says she can't see anything, so he pulls her closer and she thinks that she sees wild pigs down in the pit, but when she looks closer, she can see them clearly. Now she thinks these are some kind of prehistoric being, and they need to let some paleontologists and archaeologists know so that they can study them. Jamie hates that idea. He thinks they're going to stick his friends in a zoo. And as they argue, Sandy slips and falls into the pit. She doesn't fall all the way down, and Jamie tries to reach her, but is, he's just a little kid, and his arms are so short. He can't reach her. The trollologs can reach her. They grab her by the ankles, pull her all the way down, and it's a sandy buffet for lunch. And this is like in the movie where, like, this shit, this is the kill they regret. You know, it's like, oh, shit, I've, I've gone too far, you know, type yeah, moment. right. I've heard someone I, I cared about and shit, so. Yeah. Plus, he didn't get a souvenir either. Um, yeah. It wasn't a thrill so Jamie, kill. Yeah. Jamie runs home to tell Teddy what happened and tell Teddy reassures him that it was not his fault. Jamie's parents have returned home from Seattle. And Sandy's disappearance has made the papers, and Jamie's dad is, is reading the article from the paper. Jamie's mom is trying to find out, you know, are you, are you okay? You know, your dad's saying that something bad might have happened to Sandy. Now, Jamie says that Sandy went off with her boyfriend. So the police come to the house. And Sergeant McNally comes to the house. Sergeant McNally's a doofus. He comes to the house to take Jamie's statement. Jamie tells the, the cop that Sandy left with an older man with a mustache in a yellow car or a green car. Pretty sure it was a yellow car, but it could have been a green car. It was a man with eye patch and a scar on his face. There he goes, officer, right there, 1020. Go get him. <laughs> like that Tom Segura bit. He says, it's surprising, you know, how many times people see a crime. He says, I was standing right next to him. That guy walked up, shot him. You saw it? Yeah, I saw it. What did he look like? Man, I don't even know. I don't know. <laughs> well, as Jamie heads upstairs to bed, he sees the bloody ghost of Sandy on the stairs telling him he shouldn't tell lies. This was the best part of the movie for me because it kind of tried to really tried to be a horror movie at this point. Yeah. I mean, the director knew he had a job. He still had to, like, turn in a product. I mean, he thought he was, like, right. I don't know, they are going to, like, you know, it was going to be, like, you know, Friday 13th or some shit or, you know, some kind of, like, a psycho knockoff, you know, but, uh, which it is kind of structured, like, before he got hold of it. Yeah. Meanwhile, the police have found Abigail's bike, and the police chief says he, <laughs> he tells Officer Bentley, he said, you know why I came to live here? Because nothing ever happens here. So this guy's going to have a bad day for the rest of the movie. <laughs> At the police station, Sergeant McNally is questioning Garth, who is the last man Sandy dated. Garth is played by John Stoneham Sr. As a stuntman, he was known for his work in Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage, RoboCop, Total Recall, Police Academy 3, Back in Training. National Lampoon's Senior Trip, Blues Brothers 2000, and X-Men. All movies better than this movie. Yes. <laughs> as bad as Senior Trip was, it's so much better than this movie. Hey, I'll take Senior Trip over this day, any day. Like, man, no, I mean, me too. On, me too. It had Star Trek references in it and shit. Yes, it did. 
Well, they found Christina's tutu and the photos of Marge Livingston in Garth's car. They also found Mrs. Oliphant's wheelchair. Officer Bentley has it out in the parking garage for some reason. Uh, <laughs> and he tells off, uh, Sergeant McNally that Mrs. Oliphant is also missing. Now, the sergeant sits in the chair and asks, how could anyone possibly be missing in this town? And the wheelchair speeds away with him in it. You know, the way wheelchairs do. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jamie has some very long rope that he has tied to a tree and he tosses it into the pit. He sits on the edge of the pit and tells the trollologs that he won't feed them any more people since most of the people are pretty nice. They'll have to take care of themselves. Uh, if he finds some more nasty people, he'll bring them back, but probably not. And as he gets up to leave, he sees the bloody ghost of Sandy again and he runs away. And then the trollologs use the rope to climb up out of the pit. That night, Teddy tries to reassure Jamie that the ghost of Sandy isn't real and her death is not his fault. After all, he tried to save her. Back at the police station, Officer Bentley tries to convince Sergeant McNally that Garth didn't kill anybody and he wants the sergeant to get him help to get them help to look for the killer. But the sergeant is worried about his image, so he's not going to do it. Next day at a flooded rock quarry, Karen and Greg arrive to go swimming. Now, for both of these folks, this is their only credit, and Karen is played by the director's daughter. These are just two teenagers going out swimming one day, but there's also a POV shot as a trollolog is hiding in the brush. Cut to Officer Bentley investigating a pile of human remains in the woods. Bentley had stopped <laughs> to investigate a truck stopped on the road, and he radios back to tell the sergeant he's got a dead body. It is not a dead body. <laughs> it looks like a bunch of like butcher, uh, leftover butcher parts, just like neatly wadded up in like a little circle. Yeah, you can yeah, see like a bunch of fat, of fat yeah. trimmings and 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 chicken part. <laughs> oh man, we got this body down here, man. It's it's a, a four sixty. I need uh backup. I need a uh, ambulance. I need something. No, you you need a garbage bag, man. <laughs> Meanwhile, Karen and Greg are swimming in the in the quarry as a trolley log watches from the brush. Karen, like I said, is played by the director's daughter Jennifer Lehman. As Bentley explains, there was also a woman in the truck, but no female body found. He can hear trollologs in the woods. <laughs> I think Officer Bentley might get eaten, too. I can hear the trollologs. I don't know what that is, but I hear them. They're over in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg gets out of the water to lie on their beach towel. And this is the worst place for a beach towel, too, because it's a fucking gravel pit. Yeah. That had to be uncomfortable as hell. This was the 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 world of of scabbed over knees when this was over. This whole movie's uncomfortable. <laughs> this is the uncomfortable crown that's going to set on it. Well, Karen, Karen wants to go skinny dipping, but Greg says he's tired and turns on the radio and lays face down on on the towel. Meanwhile, Sergeant McNally and Bentley find the dead body of a woman in a cornfield. Farmer says it was done by small, deformed people, not animals. What about a zoo? You heard anything about... They got, like, orangeran things there or something? They, they put <laughs> people in the zoos in this place? What? <laughs> Orangedans? <laughs> Troglodytes? What the fuck? Yeah. Orangeran. At least he didn't call them Duran Duran. Oh, I love Duran Duran. I do, too. My favorite Girl Scout cookie. You know where they got that name from, right? No. Uh, it was the bad guy in Barbarella. Oh, okay. Dr. Duran Duran. I just know that David Bowie's son, Duncan, got into him pretty heavily. He was young. And that's how David Bowie came to produce one of their albums. And he took him on tour with him, too. Back at the quarry, a trollolog watches Karen get naked. Now, she wanted to go skinny dipping, and she's going to do it. This is the only scene that the director's wife would allow him to be present when there was female nudity because she didn't want anyone else seeing her daughter naked. It was okay for her father to see her naked. Awkward. Yeah. 
Yeah. And originally the scene was written that she would strip down completely and she was into it. She did it. But as soon as she did, <laughs> it said that Lou Lehman, he turned around and would not look and and then rewrote it so that she only takes her bikini top off. And even then he's not going to look. <laughs> so, yeah, bad for everybody, including the people who came up with the idea. Yeah. Well, the Trollolog watches Karen get naked and then snatches her and carries her off. Greg thinks he heard something, so he turns off the radio, but Karen is nowhere to be found. As he investigates, he sees a Trollolog carrying her off across the field, and when he calls to her, a Trollolog jumps him too. So now we got some... So we got all the jerks dead, and now we got a few innocents dead too. Yeah. Back at the pit... The trollologs are feasting, and the fly sounds that they added to it, that, that really worked, I think. Oh, yeah. It made this pit stink. Out at the woods, Sergeant McNally has arranged a search party. They are looking for animals, and they should shoot them on sight. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little montage of loading their weapons, and some of them are 22s, and some of them are shotguns. It's just... Folks from the neighborhood, bring which guns you got. They yeah, had to get like them from the, Wisconsin because they don't have them in Canada. All the farmers around this one little area is like all came in. It's like, yep, they're calling in for the big guns today. Yep. <laughs> They've been waiting for this shit. Nothing happens in this town. So this is the first time they actually like got to get a militia going. So this is like right, a big right. town to go get well, they truck hit, Yeah. They head into the woods and we get our first real good look at the trawl logs. They look like Ewoks if Ewoks look like miniature Bigfoots with frosted tips. Yeah, they look like uh, the littlest Bigfoot, that movie, kind of like. <laughs> Which is good, because when they first did it, it looked nothing like this. It was just like a headpiece that had the, the glowing eyes right, and then some gloves, and the actors, that was it. It just looked like a, a human body under that. Right. So uh, one of the, some of the reshoots was to, like, get someone to redesign the, the suits and make it look more because like uh i think yeah the nudity and like this whole the killing scenes of like the troglodytes or yeah. you know that's what was the the reshoots yeah i can see that because like this whole half of the movie like once she slaps them and shit it seems like everything's tacked on right it does like, he goes out there, he puts the rope on, they get out, and they start killing indiscriminately, you know? There's there's very little continuity in the story from that point on. You're right. Well, the search party has tracked the trollologs back to the pit, where they surround the pit and open fire, killing them all. Except they don't look like Bigfoots anymore. They look like your standard party city gorilla costumes. Yeah. And just blowing the shit out of them, too. It was a montage of just chunks yep. of... Like red goo coming out of these furry things underground, and then like uh like farmers like blindly shooting fish in a barrel. They made them look like the Bonnie and Clyde car. Yeah. Oh yeah. Later, a bulldozer is brought in to fill in the pit, and the police are telling everybody that it was wild dog that they had to to shoot them and bury them out here. That way, they didn't cause a panic in town. <laughs> Jamie is taken to live with his grandparents on their farm. Grandpa points out a young girl named Alicia who can be Jamie's playmate. Jamie's still got that uh, shopping bag with Teddy in it. And he tells Teddy to wait right here like the bear's going to go anywhere. Uh, wait right here while I go talk to this girl. It turns out that uh, Jamie and Alicia are kind of step cousins. And she says they can be friends. Tell you what. You chase me. And he does. And they take off running alongside a cornfield and into woods. Well, and guess what's in the woods, Jesse? Man, like, I want to say, like, uh, like a picnic or something nice. Or like they're flying a kite in a field. But I'm going to go out on a limb and guess there's a pit. There's a pit in the there's woods. A pit in the woods. Oh, God. There's always a pit in the woods. That's why I say Jamie. I don't know. Jamie can't believe it. He looks down in there. He goes, oh, no, they're trollologs. They eat people. And Alicia <laughs> says, yeah, I know. And pushes Jamie's ass into the pit. 
and it just freezes dun, dun, on dun. Jamie's scream as he falls into the pit and roll credit. Thank God. <laughs> That's that I I I said the exact same thing at the end. <laughs> uh, this is the best everybody thing to does. do with this movie. Find yeah. a pit, push this movie into it. <laughs> Hopefully I got a wheelchair when I'm doing it too. So yes. Wow. <laughs> oh god. It was the only oh, thing that made that part better is if they had the goopy scream that woo-hoo-hoo. <laughs> like right at the end. <laughs> Speed it up and play yakety sax over it. <laughs> yeah, I, I preach all the time is like studios need to let these directors be creative and stuff and like let film flourish. But there is a time and a place where like the studios and someone like, you know, up the head of the chain needs to come down on somebody and like, hey, what the hell are you doing? Because this is like <laughs> an example of that. You know, like we saw the same thing with uh, with Death Stalker 2 because yeah. the guy wrote the script, the director and the star completely rewrote the script. The writer called Roger Corman in and said, they're ruining my movie. And Roger Corman read it and said, shut the fuck up. This is funny. Yeah. Sometimes but it works. This, this guy, I mean, somebody should have. I don't think there were any dailies that they were looking at for this movie. There couldn't have been. They would have noticed this. Yeah. There couldn't they nobody was looking at the dailies because like they would have seen this this bullshit and said, "Look, you you don't get to make movies anymore." When when the writer found out about it, he he started to fuss and shit, but like by that time it was like it was already, you know, everything was going yeah. according to plan. And so, like, we don't need him no more and shit. But yeah, no, nah, it, it was fucked up. I do appreciate the humor he injected into it because I like horror comedy, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I read about, like, you know, the original spot, you know, of it and shit. And yeah. it, it would have been a great movie. But uh, yeah, they, they fucked it up. I mean, maybe we should take the original script and turn Kevin Smith loose on it. No, no, about right. Kevin Smith. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, whoever's like big in horror right now, I don't know. I'm I'm out of it. Like I'm totally jaded with like modern movies. Right. They just they suck now and shit. But uh, it's all just I, CGI action picks. Yeah, everybody's addicted to CGI. You don't really like work on characters or dialogue, and it's just everything is flushed through the system. Yeah. All right, man. I think that's a podcast. Hell yeah. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. We had a lot of fun making it. Be sure to subscribe and leave a rating wherever you hear us. You can follow CDF Pod on Facebook and Instagram or at CDF underscore pod on Twitter. You can also visit our website at CDFpod.com. And don't forget you can help us make donations to film schools all across the country by going to Patreon.com slash CDF Pod. Join us next time as we explore another movie's so awesome it probably shouldn't have been made. Sure, sure.